Hi, everyone. Thank you for listening to our podcast. Tiffany and I give our all to this podcast with curating information, researching platforms, and creating a show with the best up-to-date information you can. We have a vested interest in the growth and health of your business and hope you feel the same way about us. We've joined Patreon. Become a patron for as little as $5 a month and you'll gain access to our community, exclusive behind the scenes, speaker access, publicity for your business, webinar discount opportunities, and more. Please support us so that we can continue supporting you. Hello and welcome. I'm thirsty. Are you thirsty? I am so thirsty. For those of you who can't see us, we are drinking out of our new BBSB cups. Mm. Yes, and so um, these are really cool and you will likely see us sipping out of these quite a bit. I promise. Very has, subtle. Yes. <laughs> mine has chai, um, just in case you were wondering. Mine has a clear liquid in it. Yes. So anyway, and uh, today we're going to be talking about something that is incredibly important. Uh, it is about the sale of your business and um, what, how you should prepare for it. It's going to be, um, it's going to be a lot to talk about. So could you be considering the sale of your business? Do you see an end date upon the horizon? Uh, maybe you're seeing a retirement stage or age and you want to start getting your ducks in a row. Um, maybe you don't see the value in what you're doing anymore and you just want to get out. Whether you want to sell your business to an outside source, someone inside of the company or a relative, there's a lot of preparation involved. And if you don't follow the necessary steps, you stand to lose or owe a lot of money. Uh, we're not planning on going through all of the steps in one episode. Uh, we're going to do this in a series of shows until we've come full circle because we know how important this information is. We're starting with the most important aspect, which is the money, how to prepare, present, and create value. But before we begin, please note our disclaimer. This is available in both our show notes and on our website and should be referred to before and or after this podcast. All right. Shall we get started? We shall. Okay. All right. So let's talk about, well, when we talk about money in business, in terms of selling a business, we're really mm -hmm. talking about probably valuation, mm -hmm. which is that word everybody dreads to hear sometimes mm -hmm. because most likely what you value, value your business as is not what somebody else values it as. For sure. And nothing hits you harder in the face when you decide to sell your business and then you realize what you feel like it's worth is not what other people deem it as worth, right? Mm -hmm. We've all seen the Shark Tank episodes when somebody goes, oh, so I'm going to, you know, value my business at this level and give you equity at this percentage. And all the sharks are like, what? No. You crazy. I'd give you $10,000 for 25%. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the truth, right? When somebody buys your business, mm -hmm. they're looking at valuation very differently than you. And if you want to sell your business, you need to get with the game and understand how your business will be seen. Because ultimately, if you want to sell, you need to know how to sell it properly. Mm -hmm. It's a lot like when you're selling your house. Like if you're very emotionally tied to your home mm. and they tell you that your house is worth X and you're like, oh no, it's worth way more than that because I put this into it and I put that into it. And they're like, well, that doesn't raise the my value kids. Of your it's home. so much fun here. Yeah. Yeah. Those Nobody are the that value that raise the value of your home. Right. There are like kitchens and bathrooms raise the value mm -hmm. of your home. It's the same thing with your business. There are things that do and things that don't raise the value of your home, of your business. That is very true. And mm -hmm. so you know, regardless of what your reason is of why you want to sell your business, um, and like you were saying earlier, there's a lot of reasons. You could just be tired of it. Maybe you just want to sell it. Whatever the case may be, you just need to know the rules of the game, and you need to understand what other people will be looking at so you can start focusing your attention on building value in those areas so you get the necessary valuation you want to actually exit the business the way you want to. Mm -hmm. So um, there's quite a few factors, but I think I boiled it down to about eight factors, just kind of in a summarized form. Mm -hmm. So factor number one is, I know you'll like this one, <laughs> financial mm -hmm. performance. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Of course, revenue, profit margins, cash flow, all that good stuff means so much when you're trying to sell your business. And generally, of course, as you would imagine, businesses without a stronger financial performance have a much higher valuation than those who do not. Mm -hmm. So let's also think about, you know, what kind of revenue you're bringing in. 
recurring subscription-based revenue are usually valued higher than, say, if you go out and your services is basically to customize whatever solution to whatever your customer wants. You may be making a lot of money, but when it comes to valuations of selling your business, you may not get the value that you want, per se, because mm -hmm. it's not a predictable source of revenue, which, as a buyer, hey, that's the type of business I would want to buy. Mm -hmm. Now. Like I said, this is kind of a generalized statement. It's not true in all contexts, but you know, it's just something to kind of think about while you're kind of building your business as to you know what would attract a buyer um, that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Now, I will tell you, um, and I'm sure this is true in most transactions. Like I did mine in a private sale, so it's not quite like you know as formal as a sale where you have like brokers and lawyers and accountants all coming together. Um, but regardless of which, whenever you start a sale, the first thing a buyer asks for is a copy of your financial statements. Mm -hmm. Like straight out, that's the first thing anybody ever asks for. And if uh, you can produce one relatively quickly, or if you can't produce one relatively quickly, actually, if you can't produce one relatively quickly, or it's not accurate, that uses, usually raises like a big red flag to mm -hmm. any buyer. So just kind of keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. And I would say that one of the biggest red flags are not what you would think it is. What you may think it is is, oh, they're thinking that I just don't have um, correct financials. No, really, it's showing how unprofessional you are. <laughs> there is that too. <laughs> yes. Or how serious you are. Yeah. The there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that buyers gleam, right? Because, I mean, after all, they're putting a big chunk of money into mm -hmm. your business. It's like buying a house. Right? Yeah, It's a absolutely. big chunk of capital, mm -hmm. right? And when it's unprofessionally done, it's delayed, you can't cough up financials. It says a lot about you as a business owner, and yep. it gives them an idea of what kind of business they're buying. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely. yeah, just kind of, you know, think about yeah, that. Yeah, keep that in mind. <laughs> Something tells me you're going to talk more about this a I bit am. later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the second thing is market competition, right? That's another factor that kind of affects your business valuation. Your, if your business is in a very highly competitive market, it might be difficult to achieve a higher valuation. I mean, it's just kind of logical in that sense, right? You have a lot of competition out there. What makes your business unique? You have a lot more to fight against to actually get a bigger market share. It's just a lot of going up against you. So mm -hmm. you're just not going to be valued quite as high. Whereas if your business is really niched, um, it might be a little bit easier to get a higher valuation for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yep. The third thing is industry trends. So um, if your business operates in an industry that is growing rapidly, which I think in the last 20 years, we can all agree that in the IT industry, it is an industry that grows pretty rapidly. Mm -hmm. All the people coming up with new applications and softwares and whatnot, it is much easier to achieve a high valuation. Mm -hmm. We've all heard the story. So and so company got sold you know, for however many multiples and however many millions. Yeah. This is the reason why. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you happen to be in a business where, you know, the industry is kind of declining, a little bit outdated, then, you know, as you would imagine, you may, one, not have as many buyers, and two, your valuation just wouldn't be as high as Cupcakes, well. Cupcakes, cake pops, <laughs> martini lounges. Although you thought that, like, laundry mats would maybe be declining, but it seems like they're coming back with all the rage. Oh, yeah. Bendy machines. Oh, yeah. Apparently it's all the rage now, too, as mm -hmm. well. But, yeah, cupcakes, that's a good one. That, that was a huge thing for a while, right? So were martini that? lounges. I don't remember martini lounges. But was that a Midwest? No, thing? I don't know. I, I don't know. Although it sounds nice. Like, yeah, like but I mean, martini. it's so niche. It's so niche that it's trend. It's trendy. Yes, yes. And if you don't have the ability to, if your company doesn't have the ability, okay, I'll give you an example. Yeah. If you are a cupcake and cake pop bakery, mm -hmm. but could also do cakes and things like that and cookies, then that's different. Now you are an evolving type of company. But if you're a kind of company that that's your hard stop, like you can't get any better than that, then what's your value really? Well, you also bring up a good point. One of the things that buyers do look for is how you diversify your revenue streams mm -hmm. and where your revenue comes from. Mm -hmm. So that's where you get the whole talk about having diversified clients. So you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. yeah. And same thing with trends, right? So if you're niche and you're super, super niche, I mean, I would say you probably want to sell like while you're trending pretty hot. Oh, Otherwise, sure. you know, once that trend is over, nobody, nobody's nobody going to look at your business anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Number four is management team. So, of course, a management team can really affect your valuation. Some, a team that's strong, that's experienced, can actually increase the value of your business. While if you have a very weak, inexperienced, or poorly structured team can actually hurt your valuation. Mm -hmm. So for example, if your business is overly reliant on a key employee in your management or in your team in general, or 
it's overly relying on you as the business owner, mm -hmm. um, that can actually affect your valuation, or you might just end up getting getting a uh, deal that has less favorable terms. Mm -hmm. if you know what I mean? All right, number five is assets. So um, assets, meaning uh, property, equipment, or inventory, these kind of assets, even intangible um, assets, which I'll go into number six, IPs, patents, and trademarks, these usually play a role into your valuation as well. So all this will be taken into account when somebody kind of offers you a price for your business because they are you know, likely going to buy all of your assets. Mm -hmm which leads me to number six, which is intellectual property. So when I think of assets, the only reason I split that up is because most people think assets, they think it's like physical assets. Like tangible things. Yeah, like inventory and stuff. But you know, intellectual property these days are also actually really big assets, right? So you can IP your, you know, your trademark, you can maybe even IP your process, you can mm -hmm. IP something that you're um, obviously created or a product like that. That has a huge impact on what the valuation of your business is too. Mm -hmm. So think about that too, because you know, maybe you have something that can can be IP'd and you simply don't know it or you don't want to spend the money to actually get it done. Mm -hmm. And you know, ultimately that might affect like how much you're gonna be able to sell your business for. Mm -hmm. All right, number seven is brand reputation. So as you imagine, if you have a strong brand and it's well known in industry, then that also kind of plays into your value. Um, buyers actually do look at, at how strong your brand is to determine how much you're worth. So it's not always just hard numbers because uh, you know, brand, I mean, it kind of equates to hard numbers at the end of the day, but like in it itself isn't exactly like a, I feel like it's more qualitative than a quantitative measure of the business. So, but it does actually play a huge part into your valuation. And I mean, we've certainly known a lot of large companies with great brands that sold really, really well. And the reason why they sold really well is because of their brand, because it's not like they're only one in their, you know, industry that does what they do. They probably have a lot of other companies that do what they do, but because they're so well known, they can actually command a higher price. Yeah, and that also speaks to brands that are either named after you or hold a family name <laughs> yeah. of some sort. Yeah. Um, if that name at this point is so big that it's disassociated itself from you, the person, mm -hmm. that's different. Yeah. But if <clears throat> you and your brand are one and the same, I would think that that would affect the value of your company because people are going to always expect to have you there. Right. And it does affect the value in a sense of maybe you still will achieve the price you want, but there's probably going to be a clause in there that you can't leave the business for the next 10 years. right? Yeah. Or they're going to try to buy you with the business yes. if you're so entangled with how the customer perceives the value of the company. So if, if for whatever reason um, the company buys you and because you're not there, they know that half the customer base is going to jump ship, mm -hmm. guess what? <laughs> they're going to really want you there, which means they're either going to pay less so they can incentivize you to stay longer by mm -hmm. giving you a higher payout after the, um, after the deal, yeah. which you may not want, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people want to sell the business to retire, not to stay on board and basically work for somebody else yeah. for the next 10 years. Yeah. Or to be on the board, to have to be on, but to be stuck on the board. Yes. And yeah, <laughs> just so that you're there. You don't want to be obligated to do stuff like mm -hmm. that. So that, yep. that's certainly something to think about as you're building your business today of how you, how you want to exit. So you know how to actually build it. Mm -hmm. Now on the flip side, there is nothing wrong with selling your business and staying on board with it afterwards. A lot of people create a business that becomes becomes really valuable and really good. And then they quickly realize that, oh, they do not want to be the head of the ship. No, no, no. Yeah, definitely. You know? Like they enjoy a technical aspect of the business. And so they rather sell it to someone else who maybe has the know-how to uh, support the operations mm -hmm. and all the back office. And then you as the owner become maybe like a lead or a partner of a department. A lot and, of family businesses. Are yeah. Like and you get a lot of aut autonomy, right? Because mm -hmm. you find a good buyer that gives you the autonomy and you find the perfect place for yourself mm -hmm. where, you know, you continue to do what you love to do. You're making money, but you mm -hmm. have much less stress in the areas that you really just don't, don't mm -hmm. care to operate in anyways. Mm -hmm. So you could do that as well. Mm -hmm. All right, the final factor is uh, kind of what we were leading to is customer base. How loyal and how strong your customer base is will certainly affect your business valuation. Um, they, they'll probably look at your customer retention rate. They'll look at the satisfaction level. They'll also look at your customer acquisition costs. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that a lot of small businesses actually have no idea what most of these measurements are, mm -hmm. but it is something that you want to think about measuring. 
not just because you want to sell your business, but it is good metrics for you to just for know. sure. <laughs> and it and also just so you know that there is it's generally called churn. Yeah. Just in case someone says that to you, like what is your churn rate? And you're like, I don't know. Uh, that's what that means. It's like basically what is your turnover rate? What is the rate at which people become a client as opposed to not being a client anymore or whatever, if that's something you can measure. Or even, I guess, if it's a, if your company is a transactional, mostly transactional, like say it's a, a, a convenience store sure. or something like that where there's really no clientele, right. I would imagine that it would be more measured through the money it makes. Yes, yeah. It depends what industry you're in, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're in a service-based industry, like uh, both of us are, mm -hmm. then certainly this has a lot of merit, right? The churn is basically how long... Well, when, uh, how often do your customers turn over? And in our service-based industry, retention is everything. Mm -hmm. um, customer acquisition cost is typically a lot higher than retaining and upselling a current client. Mm -hmm. And a buyer would want to know is, you know, how, how loyal is your customers to you? Or are we going to end up buying this and spending a lot of money trying to acquire new clients um, because you simply didn't have that in place already? Mm -hmm. Um, I will tell you that when I uh, was in negotiations to sell my business, my buyer actually um, asked me for a list of my clients, and they actually called the clients for a frank conversation when we were really close to closing to make sure that, one, they're real. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and they're actually okay. happy, and they're satisfied. And we did this all in confidence, of yeah, course, yeah. right? Because we, you know, obviously wasn't – we hadn't signed a dotted line, but this was like the very last step, like almost right before we're going to sign the dotted line. Mm -hmm to um, make sure that that's, you know, that they're real. And mm -hmm. that actually makes a lot of sense. Later on, I'm going to tell you a lovely story that you probably heard off in the news of um, somebody who didn't do that. And mm -hmm. now they're in a lawsuit because they bought a whole bunch of fake clients. Mm. Mm -hmm. I know who you're talking about. <laughs> There's a couple examples There's of this. There's a few. There's like three going on yes, that I know of right that's now. That's true. There's a couple examples of this, but this one kept popping up recently, and I was like, oh, that seems relevant to what we're mm -hmm. talking about today. Mm -hmm. So the other, the last piece I'll leave with is um, you've probably heard when you're talking about selling your business and in terms of like revenue and performance and everything, you've heard of multiple being used all the time. Um, that is definitely a common way of valuing your business, especially for a privately held business, which mm -hmm. is to use a multiple of earnings. Mm -hmm. So um, usually it's like pre-tax kind of measurement, and they'll use something like seller's discretionary earnings. They'll look at things called EBITDA, which I'm sure everybody's heard of more mm -hmm. than once. So earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. You also do adjusted or no normalized EBITDA, which is way too complicated to get into and to this podcast. Um, you also hear things like discounted cash flow. Again, a lot of this varies depending on what industry you are in. Um, revenue is also a multiple that's used. Um, it, again, it's very industry specific. It's not one that's used very often. But like, for example, when I was selling my accounting business, accounting and finance happens to be one of those service industries where you typically sell based on your multiple of revenue. Mm -hmm. And it's usually about 0.75 to 1.5 multiple of your revenue. Uh, which means this is how much usually a buyer would value your business and actually um, propose a, a price that mm -hmm. they would like to acquire your business at. Or you, you evaluate your business and what price you want to sell it at, right? Mm -hmm. So I also found a uh, link um, from um, bizbuysell.com. So this is like a, like a website that's kind of um, – that sells like smaller businesses – um, so like they actually have a nice little chart of what the common multiples are for oh, like cool. the different industries and whatnot. So we'll pop that in the show notes and that way you can take a look through and, you know, just things that you want to think about mm -hmm. as you're also like looking at your business and maybe you should start, I would recommend if you're, if you want to sell your business, you should just start evaluating it and mm -hmm. analyzing it as you would if you were a buyer. Yeah. I kind of feel like you should do that even if you're not planning on selling your business anytime soon. I agree. Or or not selling your business at all. I know that yeah. I've already been doing a lot True. of the things that yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. Um, not because I anticipate selling it, but because it's important, I think, to know as an owner anyway. Like, would you buy this business if it were to be for sale for you? You know, mm -hmm. that's how I run my company. And mm -hmm. um and to be honest, I do that for the sake of whoever is, whomever is going to take over after me. It's a solid business. I mean, these are all metrics that I think any business should be looking at, mm -hmm. even if you're not going to sell. Whatever your end game is, mm -hmm. it's important to look at these factors anyways from yeah. a critical eye. Because 
I feel like it helps you kind of step out of the emotional pool mm -hmm. um, of, you know, building, you know, putting all the sweat equity and blood and tears into your business. Mm -hmm. Like this kind of helps you step out and kind of look at it from a very unbiased, critical eye yeah. and help you, you know, make changes as you need to. For sure. To build an even stronger business. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to dive in a little bit deeper about how your books should look. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you're not planning to sell your business for a while or if uh, you should keep your books, you should just definitely be keeping your books like a, a tightly run ship. Uh, this is good for so many reasons, like budgeting, future cash flow, forecasting. You know, that's the reason why I do it, um, because it helps me know what my what the health of my business is. Um, know that in this post-pandemic world, it's even harder to sell a business than before. People are scared of an impending recession. Um, I was just reading an article recently about um, how the hardest hit will be the commercial real estate, how, how mm. it will just be. It, it's already tanked, but it's going to go so much lower. Um, and buying a business now or within the next five years uh, very well could be a high risk move in saying that you'll have to be extra on your toes with your reports and reporting. If you know you will be selling your business within the next three to five years, it's worth it to have a yearly audit done to your business. This will not only show the buyer that you are serious about the sale of your business, but that you are also serious about the value of your business. Buyers are likely going to look at your financials, of course, but they will also take a look at your real estate and any equipment that is associated with your business. Buyers are taking longer to buy now, so the more lucrative your business appears, the better. You can avoid red flags by working with an accountant or an accounting firm and ensure all income is accounted for. This goes without saying, but most definitely keep your family cars and boats and <laughs> anything else that is personal off your personal, I mean, rather your business books. All that mileage and gas you keep trying to run through and your family vacation lodging. Yeah, you know, uh, once they go through due diligence, all this will be uncovered. You'll be asked those questions and it's super embarrassing when you come up with the answer of, oh yeah, well, I took my family there. Yeah. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. that's not going to come across well at all. Nope. Don't be surprised if a would-be buyer asks for a year to date results. So being diligent with your past financials is just as important as being diligent with your current financials. At a minimum, was on average, at a minimum, like buyers usually look for two to three year trends mm -hmm. at a minimum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why I said three to five, because yeah. I kind of feel like let's take it a step further. Um, but I mean, it's just good practice. Um, it's also not unusual for a commercial landlord to also be involved. Sometimes mm -hmm. they will take on the role of banker by vetting the credit worthiness of whomever it is that will be buying uh, the business uh, to transfer the lease. Like, you know, if you're not going to be moving, the the company but somebody else is going to be it's going to be under new management if you will um i've certainly seen sales not happen because the landlord did not deem the buyer credit worthy i just experienced that recently don't underestimate the power of your landlord because in a lot of ways they can act as a gatekeeper to the sale of your business so now we're going to get into the audits and the importance of financial statements that are audited Financial statements audited by an independent CPA firm provides an opinion as to whether the statements are free of material misstatements. So basically, it's not just you and your perspective of your company's financial health. It's an independent outsider's opinion as well. To the term a material refers to an error in your financial statements that is large enough to change the opinion of a buyer. So for example, if your company has a million dollar balance in inventory and there's a $500 error in your financial statements, it's probably not going to change the opinion of your potential buyer. However, if there is a $50,000 error, then and there's no answer um, or an adjustment for that error, that's going to raise a red flag. So now we're going to talk about financial statement audits. Your financial statement drives the business valuation process when you sell your business, and it's important to understand why financial statements are audited. It's very likely that a potential buyer will want to see audited financial statements, and you should consider paying for that audit each year, even if you're not ready to sell yet, like I mentioned earlier. Um, I know that this is, can cause a lot of anxiety, but you know that the audit is going to be ensuring that there are zero errors. Um, it's confirming. It's confirming that your books are good. Uh, it's also going to confirm that there's no fraud. 
big or small, uh, because it's always possible for somebody in your company to bypass controls and commit fraud. I mean, you may think that there's nothing going on, but I mean, isn't it better to be safe than sorry? Maybe, maybe it uncovers something. Um, audits are designed to identify material fraud like embezzlement or theft above a threshold that could impact uh, the opinion of a potential buyer. I did some research on a couple of different websites and they will be linked in our show notes for your reference and uh, for further information. So what is it that's so important about financial statement audits? There are a lot of buyers that are going to consider that when offering you a price for sale. But I uh, hear you asking, what are those things? <laughs> <laughs> I heard you. <ya. laughs> um, well, for one, they're going to provide qualified versus unqualified opinions about your financial statements. So what does that mean? It's so confusing, first of all. I, it sounds like they should be switched, to be quite honest. Oh, yeah. for sure. Um, an unqualified opinion is saying that your statements are free of material misstatement, meaning your statements have been provided fairly within the parameters of the audit. A qualified opinion will list some issues related to that audit. So this goes to the whole, like, this really should be the other way around. Yeah, I don't know who came up with the terms. Uh, who knows? Accountants, you know. For example. <laughs> Words are not our strong suit, apparently. <laughs> no. Uh, for example, and I pulled this one from, uh, from one of the websites that I researched. If the auditor could not perform a physical count of inventory at year end and does not have sufficient audit evidence on inventory, that issue would be disclosed in a qualified audit opinion. If there are <laughs> transactions within your business that are tied to or have a relationship with your company, these are called related party transactions. So for example, if your company buys materials from another company that is either controlled by a board member or owned by someone who works for you, an audit report will disclose this because this purchase was not with an outside third party entity. It's almost an inside transaction. This is important because if someone buys your company and they're unable to get those raw materials from the same person, or let's say they don't want to buy from that person, mm -hmm. uh, they've got their own person, is it going to change the value of the company or in turn change the financials in a negative manner? So this is uh, similar to something recently where it was a trades company mm -hmm. that was purchasing its lumber from a gentleman who worked for the company. Yeah. And then when they sold the company to a key man inside the company, that key man and that lumber person apparently didn't get along. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the person who worked for the company refused to sell their lumber now to the person who now mm -hmm. owned the business and he had to go outside and purchase lumber for almost twice the cost, mm. which obviously completely changed his uh, revenue factors. Yes. So finally, the audit should disclose contingencies. These can be memos added to adjustments to the financial statement, or in the case of a legal situation, a contingency can be an event that hasn't concluded yet. Legal issues are common business contingencies. Uh, the notes, uh, rather the links, will be in our show notes for these. So that's interesting that you brought up audits mm -hmm. uh, to talk about this. I've seen kind of a, a rising trend. So audits are expensive, guys. Like, yes. I used to be an auditor. I don't know if that was worth the hourly bills we were billing no. now, but hey, um, but they're expensive. Uh, so you're talking about, let's give a range around here. Um, well, our area is a little bit more expensive than other. Yeah. So don't, you know, like obviously take this with a grain of salt if you're not in a greater Washington, D.C. area. Mm -hmm. But I would say that your first year audit for any audits around here, let's say it's the size of business. Let's just say you're about a million. Let's say about $3 million, mm -hmm. right? So this will give you kind of a baseline. First year audits, you probably will be $15,000 easy mm -hmm. at a minimum, yeah. right? And it depends on how reputable the, the company is. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it depends on how big your company is and how big of a sale you want. The reputation, like we were saying, the reputation of the accounting company doing it will also give a certain level of weight mm -hmm. to the report that's being provided. So what, a minimum of 15000 I mean, it certainly can go up as high as forty and 50000 Again, it depends on the size of your company mm -hmm. and complexity. But for a $3 million company, I would say you're probably in a pretty good... Twenty, thirty thousand dollar range, mm -hmm. and that's for one year. Yeah, right. So you, you know, if you think about it, it, certainly adds up over time. But 
you know, if that $30,000 can get you a three to $5 million sale, mm -hmm. you know, who are you to, you know, yeah, probably would be worth the investment. Now, the other thing is there are other, other, um, trends rising about, um, not just audits, right? So there's also, accounting firms also do what's called a quality of earnings report now, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is similar, right, in mm -hmm. a sense, but also not the same. Um, audits are very rigid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, they do a lot of testing. Yes. It is, and you're right. It there's is a lot rigid. of compliance. Um, they, they measure you against uh, GAAP, US mm -hmm. GAAP, which is the uh, generally accepted accounting principles. So it's very rigid and for, but the great thing about it is that GAP is just think about like trying to create like a universal language for all of um, accounting and all the businesses, right? Mm -hmm. So they say accounting is the language of business, right? So this is like a universal language so mm -hmm. that when people see that um, they see like audited financials between um, two companies, they know that there is common assumptions and common um, rules that's being played in order to provide those reports, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And so that gives you a certain level of comfort that what you're looking at is verified and there. Um, so the quality of earnings is similar in a sense that it provides some kind of um, comfortability because it's an unbiased third party firm coming in and doing like um, a review and analysis of your business, but it's also set up very much like the report is so much bigger than an account, an audit report. It talks a lot about the business. It's really done to help businesses sell, mm -hmm. right? And help like certain parts of business shine um, in that sense. And um, not that much less cheap. It's a little bit cheaper than an audit, but not that not much that less much cheaper. cheaper. So just just be aware that there's some, some, some money you'll have to put into this, right? Well, but I do feel that it's worth it. If you've got a company that is worth a few million dollars, to me, that's chump change to do to I pay for say for so. three years yeah. or, you know, up to five years. Yeah. Uh, when you're looking at a, a huge sale, yeah. I mean. So it depends, too. Like, um, if you're looking at a smaller sale, right? So. Uh, these days, like it takes a lot of money to, to, to sell. It takes, it takes a lot of money to earn from a sale of a business for you to retire forever. Right. right. So yes, I know we hear about that all the time in the news, but guess what? I mean, honestly, they represent like 1% of the entire for sure. businesses Even in the are. United States. Right. We just hear about them more. So we think it's very common, but it's not common. Most sales are way less than what you hear mm -hmm, about in the mm -hmm. news. Right. And there's a lot of sales of businesses under a million dollars. There's a lot. You just don't Most hear about them because it's not popular to talk about, mm -hmm. but it's not such a great story for news channels to pick up on, mm -hmm. but there's a lot that happens then. So if you're under a million, um, maybe you don't need to do an audit. Maybe you don't need to do a quality of earnings because it's so expensive and you're not talking about that many dollars, but having a professional accounting firm actually put together your financials or keep up with your books would also say a lot For to sure. a buyer yes. when they see that you're serious mm -hmm. and that what they are looking at is probably far more accurate mm -hmm. or you know done in an accounting language than it would be if you or a family member. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, a family member, or somebody who's doing it for free or for a very cheap price, you know, mm -hmm. would do, right? right. And um, they, they expect a certain level of accuracy when it comes mm -hmm. to these financials, because why wouldn't you? If you're going to buy this, it's like you, if you were going to spend money buying something else, you kind of want to kick the tires and make sure right. that that's right. So, yeah. All right. Um, so let's get to the raw truth, where we each share our own gritty experience with today's topic. We want the listeners to know that success isn't easy, it's not pretty, and it's certainly not a straight line. We hope you will hear our cautionary tales and learn from them. I apologize for my sniffling pollen <laughs> season. This is horrible. I don't have allergies, but my gosh, just a lot of pollen. So it's I like know. backing up my like uh, yeah, sinuses. Me too. Trying to keep from hacking. So I'm yeah. holding it together. Sorry for that. I was like, oh, I can't help this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the raw truth for me is, um, I mean, I think we've talked about this, right? So having gone through like a private sale, um, I did a lot of homework in terms of like strategy and figuring out how to build the business for a sale. And uh, one of the things I did, which I don't think I did enough of, because, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to gauge the experience of something, especially if you haven't gone through it yet, right? So I knew it was coming, and I thought I was prepared, but then after going through it, I realized I wasn't as prepared as I thought I would mm -hmm. be, right? So anyways, long story short is, what I'm talking about is just the mindset, right? So the great thing is, I, I started early with the end of mind, which is I'm just going to sell the business. So it really clarified my strategy along the way. And I was emotionally preparing myself to actually let go of my business, which is really helpful because um, 
it's really helpful because it helped me kind of see my business as like a separate entity from myself instead of an extension of myself, which is something I think a lot of small business owners kind of fall into pretty yes. early on and mm-hmm. find that it's really hard to get yourself out of that trap. Mm-hmm. So doing that pretty early on helped me kind of set the stage so that when it came time to sell, it was a little bit easier to, you know, take what I had and kind of stick it in somebody else's mm-hmm. business essentially. Right. Like there wasn't too much um, difficulty in that sense, but uh, mindset wise though, it was still pretty hard to let it go. Mm-hmm. Right. Like it's, I don't know. Like I said, like you, you hear about the stories, but until you live it, it's just, uh, it's just not the same. Yeah. And I think the one thing, um, which I didn't realize until later on, and I think I read this somewhere is, it's really important for you to decide what you want to do after the sale. Mm-hmm. Right. And this part was really difficult because it's really hard to see beyond. I mean, first of all, you're also working a lot and you're working really hard. So mm-hmm. <laughs> cramming anything else into your mind is just really difficult, but I think it's really important to know what you want to do after the sell, not just, you know, how you want to interact with the buyer after the sell, but also what do you want to do yeah. after the sell? Because like we talked about earlier, you know, unless you're selling this for like eight, nine figures, I mean, most people do not sell their business and are able to retire. Mm-hmm. Like, it's you're going to have to do something else. You, you're going to have to do something else. Plus it is a, you know, it, you have to prepare for kind of the loss of identity mm-hmm. um, as you get to the sell because once you sell the business, guess what? You're not an owner of a business anymore. Mm-hmm. Like, that's it. Like, you're not an owner of anything. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, like, unless you have a really big sell, like, nobody cares that you sold a business. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. They only care about who you are now, what past experience you bring to the table, what kind of value you can bring today. They don't really care that you sold a business. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, you kind of get like, you know, so that if you don't sit in this limbo for too long, which I'm telling you, is not healthy for anybody. Mm-hmm. Like you want to know, like, what do you want to transition into after you sell your business? Right. It's and a good just, idea to do that beforehand. Oh my gosh. Yes. Because guess what? You do that afterwards. It's going to take you three to four months to figure it out. Maybe six months to figure it out. Hey, mm-hmm. maybe talk about personal experience there. Mm-hmm. But, <laughs> but yeah, I would say that that was probably like the biggest, most jarring, I guess, realization, Mm -hmm. um, after the fact, um, that I thought I was prepared for, but yeah, I was, you know, once you live it, it's a very different story. I agree. I would advise that. I agree. Well, I have not been in this situation, so I've no raw truth to add. Um, I will say though, that I've been a fly on the wall, so to speak, of a client or three over the years and um, that, that that have either tried to sell their company, has sold internally, and one that wanted to buy a business but backed out due to the financials. Mm. Uh, the biggest thing I can say that was a red flag that all of them shared was that the owner not only didn't pay themselves, uh, but they didn't show what paying themselves would have been or how it would have affected the financials. This is very important, mostly because at least in one case, the amount the company showed to be in profit was less than what a pay would have been. So if the company had paid, if they had been paid, if they had a salary, um, the company would have been upside down. Mm, Yeah, and nobody wants to buy a job. Mm, And that's what happens. No, You buy a business where the pay of the salary, the salary, the pay of the owner isn't somehow factored in Mm -hmm. uh, by, you know, them figuring out the discretionary income of the seller, or it's not factored in into your financials, somebody's going to do that math and quickly realize that if I buy this business, yes, I would be making some profit, but that profit will equate to basically my salary, which means I just bought a job. Yep. Who wants to buy a job? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. In each episode, we like to connect a famous example to our discussion Uh, to help you relate to our talking points in a more global or well-recognized scale. Sometimes we use exact examples of either famous persons or successful business owners of today or in history, and sometimes we use examples of people who inspire us and have inspired today's discussion. So mine is an example of what not to do (laughs) (laughs) when you're trying to sell your business. So this is kind of a hot topic right now, um, right now in 2023, I guess, Mm -hmm. in April of 2023, right? So uh, I'm talking about Charlie Javis, you think? Sure. Javis? Javis? She's like French and English. Yeah. I don't know which way to go. We'll go go with Javis. Javis. I almost want to say Jarvis, but I really (laughs) like Jarvis, so we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Javis. Okay. 
So uh, Charlie Jarvis, uh, just to give you a background of who she is, uh, attended, uh, attended college at Warren School um, at the University of Pennsylvania. And she studied finance and she studied law. Well, according to her LinkedIn profile. Right. <laughs> so at 24 years old in 2017, she founded a company called Frank, which was an online platform to really simplify the process of fi filling out the free application for federal student aid. And that is, uh, oh, so it's basically helping students get like student aid and basically simplifying the whole process of applying for student aid. Which by the way is actually quite simple. I've had to do I, it for both for my older child and now my younger child, and yeah, it's really not as hard. I don't know how difficult it was. Into I mean, I feel like okay, so I feel like in the early two thousands it was a little complicated. Maybe it was right, but I think that's also before there was a lot of scrutiny when it came to a lot of these like, yeah. financial aids and stuff. But I mean, this was twenty seventeen. This was not that long ago, mm -hmm. so I, I'm not really sure how difficult it was. But I'm not I'm not here to judge. But you know, because you've actually done a recent. Yeah, yeah, like, I did it. Yeah. I guess I did it in twenty nineteen. So. 2018, 2019 is when I filed for FAFSA for my daughters, and it was very, right. very simple. Okay. Well, so, but what apparently, uh, she claimed that she had some real world exper experience with financial aid and really struggled to pay for college. Um, although, you know, it's kind of ironic now because she was also listed, uh, one of those 30s under 30s on Forbes magazines on the finance list. And part of her profile said that she grew up in like a very affluent Westchester County of New York and she rode horses and attended French American School of New York. So yeah, well, well okay. Which one is it? Which one is it, right? Also said that her father worked as uh, worked at a hedge fund. Her mother was a life coach, and um, but regardless, you know, uh, she said that her mother and her really struggled when we were talk talking about financial aid and really had tough conversations, grueling, emotional, as she would say, with financial aid officers when it came time, I guess, to paying for her college education. So, she said that she started the company with. A, a, a rebellious spirit and a big, big goal that students should just pay less for college. Anyways, <laughs> so she started her company, Frank, in 2017. In about four years' time, she herself, or Frank rather, became the leading and fastest growing college financial planning platform that served over 5 million students in more than 6,000 colleges. Wow. So around this time, as one of the chief executives, uh, she set out to actually sell Frank and caught the attention of J.P. Morgan Chase, the bank. Mm. So, like we said, what did J.P. Morgan Chase do? J.P. Morgan Chase said that they needed to verify that her company had the 4.25 million customers that it claimed to have. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> now... I got to give it, I mean, J.P. Morgan Chase was doing the right thing. I mean, if somebody is coming after you for fraud, I mean, what are you, what are you, you can't get around fake stuff, right? So when they were asked to basically verify these customers, what Charlie Javis did was she asked her company's director of engineering to create an artificially generated data set. Uh-huh. <laughs> Which, to that engineer's credit, refused to do. Mm -hmm. So then she went outside and hired an outside data scientist to basically create a synthetic data set that she purchased for $105,000 on the open market for real information of real students that she can then claim to be part of her 4.25 million um, customer base. I wish our listeners could see my face right now. <laughs> this is also a great reason for why you should tune in to our videos instead. Yes. So soon to be on Spotify and already on YouTube. So JP Morgan Chase, of course, not knowing that, you know, what they verified was not correct, agreed to purchase the company for $175 million. And what happened was once they took over the company, they realized that Oh crap, none of this is real because a lot <laughs> of the results you were trying to get from like a marketing campaign for these user users generated very little responses, which didn't make sense. And so as they looked into it, they realized that, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> they didn't exactly buy they bought a lemon. Lemon, is that the right way to right way yeah, to put it here? They bought a lemon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, just to give you an idea of the size of the deal, so according to the SEC, um, the $175 million acquisition meant that she, uh, Javis, uh, received $9.7 million directly in stock proceeds, millions more directly through trust, and a contract entitling, entitling her to a $20 million retention bonus as a new employee of JPMorgan Chase. 
Hmm. That's one juicy deal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Delish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so as of today, Javis is, uh, was charged with one count of conspiracy to commit bank and wire fraud, one count of wire fraud affecting a financial institution, and one count of bank fraud. For each of these counts, she, she is charged with carries a maximum sentence of 30 years in prison. She also faces one count of security fraud, which, which carries a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison. And as of today, which I think literally as of today or yesterday, she was out on $2 million bail and has agreed to electronic monitoring and curfews and um, also has been told that she is not allowed to talk to any of the investors of Frank while this is being decided what her fate's going to be. She can't hate the play or hate the game. The thing is, I think she knew the the, the rules of the game. She was just trying to play the rules Don't of the game. Don't play the game unless you know you're going to win. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I know. Well, I am going to be on the flip side of that. Uh, my famous example is Indra Nooyi. Mm. She is an Indian American business exec and former CEO of and, and chairperson of PepsiCo. Also a lovely speaker. I've seen her a couple times on the YouTube, oh. like 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 uh, platforms, whatever. When she was speaking, oh, good speaker. She was amazing. And Great I'm not story. really, I'm not really gonna, I'm gonna be glossing over a lot of what she did for uh, changing Pepsi to what we know it as today, uh, because she did experience a lot of pushback and there mm-hmm. were some very controversial things that she chose to do. Yes. Um, but we're going to start with um, her having joined PepsiCo in 1994. And she had an almost immediate influence on the company's strategic direction. In 97, she spearheaded the sale of Pizza Hut, KFC, and Taco Bell for $4.5 billion. They used the proceeds towards their $8.5 billion debt. So they reduced their debt in half, and they were able to push their buyback strategy forward, giving them more muscle to invest in future business developments. The following year, Nui played a key role in PepsiCo's acquisition of Tropicana. The $3.3 billion deal was particularly significant for the company as it placed Pepsi in direct competition with rival Coca-Cola in the non-fizzy drinks market. Now, you may or may not remember um, where Coke was and where Pepsi was prior to 1994, but there is a fantastic podcast on um, business wars. Business wars. I was going to say, they had a a big show about it. It is amazing you must 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 listen to this they do go a little bit more into the grittiness of what she had to endure and and what what she did really for pepsi but prior to her showing up i mean pepsi was looking at not even being in existence anymore like it was really really bad it was a big rival like in the 90s i remember Coke oh versus pepsi. yeah Oh my God. Which came out with such great commercials that we talk about today. (laughs) But like, this is at a time when Coke was just killing the scene. They had new Coke. They had come out with uh, diet Coke and Uh cherry Coke. All of that came out. And Pepsi went the celebrity route, I feel like. I think they're the first one to bring the celebrities into the They did. They did. Um, Well, in any case, so in 2000, Pepsi Co. made another strategic acquisition with its purchase of Quaker Oats. Now, this is where I'm talking about Mm. what she had to endure um she had a lot of pushback on this because they were like freaking Quaker oats what um the 13.4 billion dollar oh price tag gosh. was controversial i mean she got a lot of heat for this um but the deal handed pepsi control quaker uh quaker's popular and lucrative sports drink gatorade um if i remember correctly she also got a lot of pushback for um and i i could be wrong but i'm pretty sure it's dasani Dasani, I think. Dasani is also Pepsi, yeah. Yes. PepsiCo, yeah. So she got a lot of pushback from wanting to buy a company that bottled water. What? It was crazy. Crazy talk. Because, you know, in the early 90s, nobody was drinking bottled water. It's not like this is a lot of money anyways we're talking about. Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> one of one of New Year's most controversial initiatives had been to redirect Pepsi's considerable corporate spend away from junk food into healthier alternatives. To this end, she reclassified Pepsi's wide-ranging products into three categories designed to give customers more information about the foods you consume. Fun for you, such as potato chips and regular soda. Better for you, like low-fat or diet versions of snacks and fizzy drinks. And good for you, such as the recently acquired Quaker Oats. 
dietary balance has been a key feature of New Yi's strategy since day one. In 2010, she declared that Pepsi needed to be a part of the solution to the one of the world's biggest public health challenges, a challenge fundamentally linked to our industry, obesity. Under her steer, Pepsi has reduced the portion size of its Fun For You products and has delivered a marketing campaign to ensure its diet products are promoted as aspirationally as it is its full sugar equivalents. For example, Gatorade is now marketed specifically towards athletes rather than being advertised as an everyday recreational beverage. Mm. There's a great interview uh, by the Harvard Business Review with her, which really showcases how out of the box she thought and how she pulled others to do the same to change the direction of Pepsi. She um, There's this whole thing she talks about how she had all the executives um, do an art <laughs> an art project and like half of them didn't do it and then the rest of them didn't even understand what they were doing and she was like how can we how can we be creative about our art when you're asking me should we change the blue to a different blue <laughs> you know so the link is going to be in our show notes that is pretty amazing though because yeah. she's talking about like you know turning the head of a giant essentially mm. oh yeah 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 i mean she was she is very aspirational i feel like mm -hmm. and um a great yeah, a great example of what we're talking about here. Um, so uh, with each episode, we like to share either books, tools, apps, or platforms, or anything we think is a great next step and connector to our discussion. So if you like our subject matter and want to learn more, this you'll have a great place to start. Yay. So of course I have podcasts and books to work on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, so when I was when I was actually doing research to uh, figure out how to, how to kind of build my business to sell naturally, uh, John Warlow's book, uh, Built to Sell, kind of came up mm -hmm. top of the list. Um, it's a very popular book. It's also a very short read. I actually forgot I had the book, so I had to go back and look for it. And I was like, oh, I already bought this book. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a very short read, but it kind of gets you in the right mindset um, if you are wanting to sell your business, kind of the things you want to prepare for. Mm -hmm. um, the other the other book that he has is called The Automatic Customer. Um, I haven't read this yet, but I actually really do want to go read it. Um, it's called The Automatic Customer, uh, how to build a subscription-based business in any industry. Hmm. Um, and like we were saying a little bit earlier about how reoccurring subscription-based revenue tends to command a higher valuation most, most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and plus, I just love the fact that, love the fact of reoccurring revenue. Let's oh, just yeah. be honest. I like it too. <laughs> but it is a challenge sometimes, um, or most of the times, to do this in a service-based industry. So I also, um, I mean, I like a good challenge, so mm -hmm. I always like doing it, but it is possible. So yes. just keep that in mind. But anyways, great book probably to go check out. Um, he also has a podcast called Built to Sell, so definitely listen to that. He interviews a lot of people who are buyers or sellers of their businesses. So you get to really hear a lot of great insights uh, as to, especially buyers, what they're looking for, how they look for. I mean, these are like professional buyers, mm -hmm. right? This is what they do. They buy businesses, mm -hmm. you know, and then they restructure them. And then sometimes they sell them, sometimes they hold them in a portfolio, right? So it's really cool to kind of hear from their aspects of what they're looking at. And there are common themes. So th good things for you to know as well. Mm -hmm. uh, the other podcast I recommend is um, Empire Flippers podcast. Um, they Empire Flippers, if you haven't heard of them, um, what they do is they buy and sell mostly in the digital space. So a lot of e-commerce mm. businesses, digital businesses, and whatnot. They've made a really great name for themselves. Their podcast is incredibly good. Um, yes, I understand we're talking about digital sales of businesses, but still the concept and the framework is largely the same. Mm -hmm. um, and then last but not least, there's another podcast. Um, so I don't think this guy is as well known. Um, maybe, I don't know. But I kind of stumbled across him on YouTube kind of by accident. Um, but I like what he says. So basically, he's a business broker, um, and his name is David C. Barnett, and his podcast is called Buy and Sell Small Business. Mm -hmm. And what I like about it is he focuses on the small business. So we're not talking about $10 million sales. He's really talking about $5 million, mostly a $1 million in under mm -hmm. sales, which is, I think, practical reality. Yeah, it's probably the most common. Exactly. And so he actually really gets into buying and selling businesses of that size, which I certainly appreciate because... Mm -hmm. You know, as much as I enjoy listening to businesses that sell for billions of dollars, that is not my aspiration. <laughs> yeah. Not that I'm going to say no to it. The universe wants to send me that opportunity. Bean. I'm not going to um, say no. Exactly. But, you know, it's, it's never been my aspiration. So mm -hmm. it's nice to hear about um, topics that are a little bit closer to the reality that we mm -hmm. live in. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. Change. 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 <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no, aim real, aim real, aim real. right? Aim is- real. So, uh, so of course, as you would imagine, business brokers are helpful, right? Mm-hmm. So if you want to get a business broker, uh, you, you should find one that works for your size of businesses, right? Mm-hmm. Otherwise, the fees will get a little expensive. And mm-hmm. um, there are a lot of brokers who are kind of spe- specific to smaller businesses versus yep. the really large ones. Um, but, you know, if you want to do a private sale, you want to go with a broker, you want to make sure you also have a good lawyer and a good CPA or a good tax account that can actually advise you on the tax implication of the deal that you probably won't be able to forecast and is also super important to you afterwards because it's going to impact you. Mm-hmm. So those are those are really important to have. Because once it's done, it's done. Once it's done, it is done. That is correct. My biggest recommendation is to talk to a CPA. Uh, You may want to hire a firm that specializes in valuations, and I recommend you start getting audits done yearly. If not an audit, I mean, of course, again, we go back to how much is your company actually worth. If you're talking about a business that's a couple million dollars, I think it's worth the investment of an audit. Now, if your business is not quite that large, your business is maybe much smaller than that, maybe not so much a yearly audit, but definitely an audit before you sell the company. Well, so it depends, too, I think, of how comfortable you feel with financials, right? Here's the whole, I think what we're getting at is pay attention to your financials, people. Yes. <laughs> That's what we're getting at, right? Yes. So if you don't feel comfortable and maybe you hired a bookkeeper or you mm-hmm. hired somebody who maybe is helping you keep together the books but may not understand kind of the greater um, story that your financials are supposed to to have, mm-hmm. and, you know, have a firm outside of your company come help make sure that this is all put together. Yeah. Right. So if you don't can't afford audit or you don't want to do an audit, even though I think if you if you are intending to sell an audit is not a bad idea mm-hmm. at all. But um, that's for whatever reason, let's say you don't want to do it. You got to at least have financials that you know that are accurate and basically ready to turn on a dime when a buyer comes along and says, hey, mm-hmm. I have intentions of buying a business. Can I review your financials to see at least the preliminary? What am I getting myself mm-hmm. into? And then you yourself also need to need to understand enough to to read these financials, because if it's not telling the story you want, then you, you got to figure out why. Mm-hmm. But know that you have to spend money to make money. I, I, again, I go back to the whole sale of a house. You know, like maybe you don't want to put in a whole brand new kitchen in order to sell your house for a higher level because your kitchen cabinets are totally fine. They may be 30 years old, but they're totally fine. So then uh, paint them or do something to make them look really nice and not just on the t- on the cover. I mean, like do something that's going to bring up the value of your, of your home because... A person's going to look at your house, let's say, and and I'm go, I'm using your, you know, uh, as a symbol. But like they're going to look at your house and be like, oh man, uh, I'm going to buy this house for this much. But then I have to add a new roof. I have to change the kitchen. Mm-hmm. I have to change the bathrooms. So really, the price of the house is not this. Price. It's really this. Yes. So no thanks, no deal. I'm not yep. going to buy it. That's so, exactly but right. if you invest your own money into it and you raise the uh, value of your home, people are going to be scrambling to have a, a turnkey home. You want your business to be turnkey as well. So in saying that, you might want to talk to an M&E specialist mm. as well. Conversations with people who do this for a living will help you get a better understanding of what to prepare for and how. Exactly. Like if you're new to buying a home or you're new to flipping a home, let's just mm-hmm, even say, mm-hmm. right? Like just anything about a home, right? You don't know where the value is. You don't know if adding like, okay, well now we have HGTV, so this is a little oh, bit different. Yeah, or but whatever. Yes but and no, but you, yeah, but you probably don't really know where to add value into your home. Like should you finish the basement or is that more important than the kitchen? Is that mm-hmm. valued more than the bathroom? You don't know this. And so you may spend a lot of time just kind of running yourself in circles. Whereas if you just talk to an M&E specialist, which most of the time they're open to have a conversation oh, because yeah. they would love for you to be a customer in the mm-hmm. future, they can point you in the right directions of what you do, where you need to add value to your business, for your industry, for your type of exit. So at least now you know what you're aiming for mm-hmm. and you're not blindly just trying to figure it out on your own. Mm-hmm. That's, I think that's the key. Is, that I think is worth the best. That to me is the, yes, worth the, be, the investment. investment. <laughs> And, yeah, and, on that uh, note, and on that note, <laughs> let's close out today's episode because we've lost our words yeah, already. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so we are going to continue this discussion and we're going to move forward with what more you need to know about the sale of your business in our next episode. Uh, please show us your support by following us on your preferred podcast platform, social media, and YouTube um, and Spotify. So yes, we can finally upload videos to Spotify now. So. Yeah. 
please like, please leave a comment, please like, please leave us a review because totally. that's what keeps the platforms promoting us. And, you know, we, we need their help because we're on their platform to help promote us as well as all the promotion we do ourselves. And mm -hmm. of course the promotion that hopefully you're kind enough to share our episodes out there with any friends Mm -hmm. Do you think we'll find it interesting? And I'm doing my best to keep our Instagram up to speed and up to date as well. <laughs> it is BBSB underscore official. So please follow us there as well. We are sharing a few things here and there. Um, mostly me, not we. Um, sure. <laughs> I'm still working on uh, getting back on social media though, but you get to see some lovely behind the scenes of what a bootstrap podcast looks <laughs> totally, like. Totally. Totally. <laughs> I mean, we don't just talk about it. We live it. Yeah. We, we live the bootstrap <laughs> life apparently though, but no, come, 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 come with us. I think, yes. um, leave Enjoy us, the journey. leave us a comment and let us know. So. Yes. Um, all of our, uh, links will be posted below and until next time, mind the business behind your small business. Because all great business successes start small. <laughs> Bye. I feel like I feel like we need to cheers one yes. last time. Cheers. Good mm. job.